Here is today's news release from the Royal Canadian Legion, 359 Kent Street, Ottawa, Ontario. The Royal Canadian Legion conducts a poppy campaign each year in the days preceding Remembrance Day. All proceeds are placed in trust accounts and after expenses, including the cost of poppies, are paid the funds used to assist Canadian ex-service personnel and their dependents, and ex-service personnel of Commonwealth countries and of allied countries resident in Canada. Although the poppy campaign is national in scope, each unit of the Legion is responsible for running its own campaign, collecting funds in its own area. And the National Remembrance Program, November the 11th in Ottawa, is produced and directed by the Royal Canadian Legion and is conducted and carried out with the assistance of a multitude of organizations and the federal and municipal governments and a host of volunteers. There is a National Ceremony Committee comprising of representatives of the Canadian Armed Forces, Radio, Television, Police, Department of Veterans Affairs, Public Works, Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, and the St. John Ambulance. The Silver Cross Mother is selected and brought to the national ceremony by the Royal Canadian Legion. From Channel 11, the actual voices and sounds of World War II. World War II was the first conflict in the history of man to have preserved for future generations the sound record of its drama and horror. People thousands of miles from the battlefields could hear over their radios the sound of war, from the ominous wail of the London air raid signal to the explosions of the Japanese bombs on Manila. One was able to tune in to immediate death and destruction. Has one ever realized that when Edward R. Morrow spoke from the London rooftop during a Nazi bomb raid over the city, the muffled explosions in the background were the living sound of death. This sound record of World War II is not designed to add new light to the many written accounts of the war. It is, however, offered to bring into complete focus the time and events by giving the actual sound to the word and to the motion picture image. Every communication medium now, for the first time, leaves for generations not yet born the history of the action as it took place the actual voices and sounds of World War II. And it was on June the 18th, 1940, Prime Minister Churchill's words as Great Britain stood alone against the Nazi onslaught gave almost divine inspiration to the island and its empire beyond the seas. For it was then that he said, if the British Empire and its commonwealth will last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Surely, Winston Churchill's words, I have nothing to offer you but blood, toil, tears and sweat, moved the free world with the same inspiration and emotion as his famed V for victory symbol. Certainly the magnificent declaration of war speech by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Congress after the Japanese Pearl Harbor attack was one great sobering oration needed to change a frightened, shocked nation into a country both strong and resolute towards a tremendous united effort against the enemy. Can now one person wonder and all the world wonder for many years to come? What kind of men were they? The Sounds of World War II. Now progress has given war new terms and new dimensions. The atomic countdown has replaced a Roger Wilco, and Max 3 has made the anti-aircraft gun obsolete. So, for future generations, the sound of war as be served here is a tragic closing of an era, to be forgotten and remembered. Forgotten because it was perhaps the blackest time in the history of man. Remembered because it ushered in the last chance that civilization will have in its continual struggle for peace, the sound of World War II. And 
and so even the young can dream. Remembrance Day means much to those who lived through the First and Second World Wars, but if the meaning is to endure, then there must be continue to be a message for the younger people who have known no war. The people of the post-war generations are the ones who are inheriting this troubled world, and it is they who would bear the brunt of battle should another war start. So it is the children of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and now the 80s who should be most concerned about the threat of war and the seeming boredom with peace which now exists. And so the young people are left in a strangely muddled times, with most of the passions and clear-cut causes of the 60s gone. Times are not as tough as the 30s, but they are tougher than they have been, and the world is very much more complicated. The times seem to breed a sort of hard-driving fatalism in many of the schoolchildren of today. A recent graduates have said, we're here for a good time and not for a long time. The young people of 1980 will, before too long, be moving into positions which decide war and peace. They will have to see that the world does not slide into another war. The course is not an easy one, but for the young on Remembrance Day, they are examples which still say, no one need to be shy about dreaming of a better tomorrow. It was the Christmas battle of 1943. Weary Canadian soldiers paused for prayer in the church of Santa Maria near the front line. Christmas dinner was being served in the church and in the headquarters mess. The battle raged and men died that Christmas day. A Canadian officer, Major Alex Campbell of the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, wrote a short poem just before the battle in which he was killed on that December the 25th, 1943. He called the poem Prayer Before Battle, and it expresses how he felt that fateful day. When neath the rumble of the guns I led my men against the Huns, it's then I felt so all alone and weak and scared, and oh, I wonder how I dared accept the task of leading men. I wonder, worry, fret, and then I pray, O oh God, who promised, oh, to humble men to lend an ear. Now in my troubled state of mind, draw near, O oh God, draw near, draw near. Make me more willing to obey, help me to merit my command. And if this be my fatal day, reach out, O oh God, thy helping hand, and lean me down that deep, dark veil. Those men of mine must never know how much afraid I really am. Help me to lead them in the fight so they will say he was a man. Flanders feels the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the lark still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And they went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. 
at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. Remembrance Day, 1980. 11th, Canadians will gather in some 2,000 cities, towns, and villages. Here they will stand with heads bowed and a poppy on their breast. In the two minutes of silence, they will pay tribute to the more than 100,000 Canadians who were killed in war. Each will remember in his own way. Perhaps veterans will think of their comrades just a few seconds before their death. Wives will remember the long wait for husbands who went to war and never returned. Parents will think of boys who were so young when they left home for the last time. During the two minutes of silence on Remembrance Day and over the period during which you and others wear the poppy, try and relate your feelings to those of the young people of the same age who lived, loved, worked and played during the wartime periods of our history. Think also of those who went to war and did not return. Remember their sacrifice and work to preserve the traditions of Canada and the freedom we all enjoy. If you do this, you will understand the true meaning of remembrance. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The following poem was written by Mr. Charles H. McAlena of McAdam and entitled The Legion. The men of the Legion hold a place cherries by all of our noble race. Their claim to the greatness they all share. Their simplest statement, we were there. Joined by the ties of gruesome war, bathed with blood on a foreign shore, eager to fight and ready to die, to keep our Canadian honor high. Think of history bit by bit, page after page of guts and grit, gas at Ypres and Bimmy Mud, African Desert and Arctic Scud. Dunkirk, Dieppe, and the Nameless Stand, Canucks have made it in a host of lands. Gaze on the battle of flags unfurled that show where they have fought to save a world. When war is ended, when peace is won, let all remember what they have done. Father in heaven, hear their prayer. Grant them thy mercy, they were there. The preceding poem was entitled, The Legion. 
and written by Mr. Charles H. McAlena of McAdam.